Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni who have joined us today for this webinar on countering transnational organized crime, which is entitled Responding to Transnational Organized Crime, Perspectives on Security, Development and Governance. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and I am pleased to be the moderator of this webinar. I want to thank everyone across our alumni community who has joined us today. You come from a variety of different countries and from different military and civilian positions within and outside of uh, the security sector. So we're pleased to have so many of you with us today for this important discussion. In terms of the CTOC series of webinars that this is a part of, as most of you know, this is the eighth webinar in the Africa Center series about professional development for countering transnational organized crime in Africa, which we have been running since last October. So thank you to those of you who have attended previous webinars and welcome to people who are newcomers. You can find videos of the entire series of the webinars proceedings on the Africa Center website and the link to that specific part of the website will be provided now in the chat box on Zoom, in Zoom. Those of you with us today have different backgrounds, as I said, different experiences, different knowledge about transnational organized crime. And for this series, no experience, background, or knowledge is required. Uh, but we also know that there's some alumni on the audience with extensive experience on these topics. So for those with limited knowledge, about transnational organized crime, we urge you to ask questions that will help all of us improve our understanding of the phenomenon. And for those of you with a wealth of experience, we encourage you to please share with us your experiences and your perspectives. In terms of the Africa Center, as most of you already know, uh, these webinars are informed by our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships and catalyzing strategic solutions. The mission is guided by our vision, which is to advance security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions accountable to their citizens. We hope that your participation in these webinars will contribute to uh, this mission and vision um, and, and the goals that you have for yourselves and the work that you're doing on this topic. To remind ourselves in terms of this series, um, the series we're hoping um, that we have helped to expand understanding of transnational organized crime on the continent and ways to counter it, and to have introduced you to some new data on transnational organized crime in Africa, as well as methods and approaches for monitoring it based on some of the key elements in particular of the organized crime index created by the ENACT consortium. Um, in the series, we've introduced this organized crime index which is a tool of the ENACT Consortium, which consists of Interpol, Institute for Security Studies Africa, and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. So they have published that index, um, and the index analyzes criminal actors, criminal markets, vulnerabilities to transnational organized crime that different African states face, and it also identifies 12 resilience factors that shape African state responses to transnational organized crime. So speakers in this Africa Center series have walked us through different kinds of criminal actors and criminal markets that are in play here, different kinds of vulnerabilities that are being faced. Um, and uh, different speakers have also helped us analyze how various resilience factors play out um, from law enforcement and judicial capacity to political leadership and good governance to international legal frameworks and conventions to civil society involvement in prevention efforts and, and, and more. Um, so in this culminating webinar, we will try to bring all of the threads together. We will assess how security development and governance all play into addressing transnational organized crime. And we will look at how a country's risk and resilience profile may matter in this and how their neighbors risk and resilience profiles may also matter for response. So with all of that said, let me introduce our two distinguished panelists. We're very happy to have both of them with us today. They are two highly regarded experts who have specific data and tools for responding to transnational organized crime to share with us and explain to us today. I have with me Mr. Martin Awey, who is technical coordinator of the ENACT project at the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, South Africa. In this capacity, he conducts research and analysis, coordinates and manages five regional organized crime observatories in Africa, 
and he monitors trends, issues recommendations, and provides training and technical assistance on these topics. He was previously a senior researcher on terrorism and counterterrorism at the ISS and had also served as a political affairs officer at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague um, in uh, past roles. You have a more full bio for Mr. Martin as well as for Dr. Brooks Stearns Lawson um, on our website. Dr. Brooks Stearns Lawson is a senior conflict governance and crime advisor with USAID's Africa Bureau where she provides technical assistance, program management, and policy guidance. Her work has focused on organized crime and in particular, illicit trafficking in minerals, wildlife, and other natural resources. She also looks at conflict and violence prevention, conflict sensitivity, and private sector engagement. Uh, prior to joining USAID, Dr. Stern Blossom was a doctoral fellow at the RAND Corporation where she at the intersection of development and security. So welcome to both of our panelists, and I'll begin the discussion by turning to Martin. Martin, could I ask you to spend six or seven minutes um, speaking a bit about how governance issues affect transnational organized crime and how you think governance uh, should play into responses to it? Um, I'm wondering if you have insights from the regional organized crime observatories or other parts of your work that you could share on that question, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly. I also want to thank uh, the participants uh, for attending this, uh, uh, this webinar. Um, I'm also very glad to share the podium with uh, uh, Dr. Stern. Um, uh, Dr. Kelly, it's always a pleasure, uh, an immense pleasure uh, to be part of uh, an ACSS event and particularly to work with you and uh, the team uh, at the ACSS. Allow me on behalf of the Institute uh, for Security Studies, the ISS, uh, to convey to the, IS, uh, to the ACSS team our profound gratitude for the extraordinary and exemplary work of the center in addressing security concerns in Africa and for partnering with uh, African institutions like the ISS. We really appreciate uh, our partnership. Uh, now, let me turn to, uh, to the question that uh, you have uh, asked. I want to start off uh, by stressing the important role that governance uh, play either as a maker or a breaker of transnational organized crime in Africa. No other factor uh, has had such an instrumental role in determining trends in, trans in transnational organized crime uh, than uh, uh, governance. Although a number of scholars and um, our previous studies at the uh, Institute uh, have pointed this out, but it was always difficult to measure or quantify the true extent of the relationship between governance and transnational organized crime until the INACT uh, project uh, launched the Organized Crime Index in 2019, in September 2019. Um, ENACT uh, is an acronym uh, that stands for uh, Enhancing Africa's Response to Transnational Organized Crime. It is a project funded in its entirety by the European Union and implemented by a consortium of uh, three partners, uh, the Institute for Security Studies, Interpol and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, the project is built around regional organized crime observatories manned by regional organized crime coordinators, whom we refer to as the ROCOs. The novelty in the ROCOs has been the intensity and systematic monitoring, analysis, and reporting on trends in organized crime in Africa, something that had not been previously done. Uh, through the work of the ROCOS, uh, we now understand the relationship between governance and organized crime much better than we did before. Governance itself is a very complex term uh, and could mean different things to different people. For the sake of clarity, 
uh, it is important to note that the governance issues we are referring to uh, here include gaps in leadership, the dynamism of the architecture of governance, the tools that are used for governance, institutions and mechanisms for managing security threats, the rule of law, political will, issues of corruption, and the nature of state embedded actors. The OCI, the Organized Crime Index, is designed to measure criminality, that is how states are affected by organized crime, and resilience, uh, that is how states uh, respond and manage, uh, and manage the threats uh, themselves. The indicators for measuring the two are different. Uh, while the criminality indicators measure essentially the prevalence of the different criminal market, uh, drug trade, arms and human trafficking, and so on and so forth. There are about uh, uh, 10 criminal markets that are discussed or um, um, are used in the index. And of course, the presence of criminal actors. We have four categories of criminal actors that are discussed and measured by the index. Now, this is, uh, these are the two uh, critical components for determining um, the criminality uh, index for determining whether criminality is high in a country or it's low. That is the presence um, of criminal actors and the uh, 10 uh, criminal markets uh, that uh, uh, we have selected. Uh, the resilient indicators are actually meant to measure governance um, or how states respond to and protect themselves against the criminal market. This is essentially all the good things that state do to address fragility or their vulnerability to transnational organized crime, such as the adoption of national laws and policies, degree of state territorial control and integrity, which means the absence of ungoverned spaces, the strength of law enforcement institutions, uh, transparency and accountability, leadership and governance, uh, independence of the judiciary, and of course the activeness of non-state actors and civil society organizations. Through their research and uh, systematic monitoring of organized crime on the ground throughout the five regions in Africa, the ROCOs have been able to discern common trends and characteristics of organized crime across the continent. The lessons learned uh, have helped us to sharpen the focus of INACT's work. Um, our research, for example, has a focus, has a policy focus, and is uh, evidence-based. Our technical assistance and capacity building programs are focused on the immediate need of state. Some of the gaps in Africa's responses to uh, transnational organized crime uh, have to do with the lack of political will, limited international cooperation, and incessant claim to sovereignty, which has hindered cross-border cooperation among law enforcement agencies. Another problem has been the demarcation of regional borders, where some uh, people have claimed, oh, I belong to West Africa. Some will say I belong to East Africa, and therefore uh, you cannot come in to, um, to investigate criminals, or you cannot just cross borders at will. You need to fill out paperwork and so on and so forth. Uh, this has also prevented law enforcement agencies and other criminal and other technical institutions from cooperating in the fight against uh, crime. So pay-to-pay -pay, uh, cooperation uh, and other forms of informal cooperation uh, have not worked due to claims on sovereignty and uh, the political borders. Because of the lack of effective governance, critical infrastructures like airports, ports, border posts, transport hubs, and many others have become principal conduits of transnational organized crime. To address these issues, therefore, uh, we realize that uh, countries' responses uh, have been ad hoc and fragmented. What is needed to address these shortcomings are robust governance tools that seek to harness effort 
and mobilize resources. And of course, to institutionalize responses to TOC across the continent so that um, we can abandon the ad hoc approach that we have now where countries just decide because they were told uh, maybe by the World Bank or another international institution, it could be the UN um, to do a few things, they do it uh, once and then forget about it. We need to have institutionalized responses. Criminals themselves should, not, should know what will happen to them uh, when they uh, trespass uh, borders or they commit a crime. Um, to address uh, these uh, challenges, um, INACT is helping states and pan-African institutions to have the requisite governance mechanisms to effectively manage and stem the sources of TOC, um, a TOC threat in Africa. Through these technical assistance and capacity building programs, we have introduced measures that shift from the traditional top-down approach to dealing uh, with TOC threats in Africa by encouraging peer-to-peer -peer collaboration across uh, uh, countries and regions. Uh, for example, we have been able to assist uh, West and Central Africa and Central and West and East Africa to adopt agreement for the practical cooperation among law enforcement agencies. These agreements, which are drafted by practitioners from the region uh, or from the countries themselves, address operational issues such as the pursuit, uh, such, such as hot pursuit, arrests and treatment of criminal suspects and handing over or transfer of criminals from one country to the other. Uh, all of these uh, acts, uh, which are just some, uh, some uh, practical challenges, uh, there are numerous of them, especially for those who are working on the ground. Uh, these challenges, however, have uh, hindered um, any effective cooperation in the past. Uh, but through this agreement, um, a policeman from um, a country in Central Africa, you can take Gabon, can be able to pursue a criminal uh, up to Kenya without having to, uh, um, to fill out uh, the paperwork or without having to, uh, to stop on borders uh, because he is crossing another region or crossing another country. Um, the agreement uh, uh, makes it uh, possible um, for law enforcement um, agencies, not only to talk to themselves, but to cooperate on practical issues uh, informally and formally. Uh, this agreement therefore eliminates many of the traditional and bureaucratic bottlenecks uh, that have prevented effective cooperation among law enforcement officers, irrespective of their country or region. Uh, I just want them to highlight that uh, the fragmented and limited responses to TOC, we are also encouraging regional communities and other Pan-African institutions like ECOWAS, the Southern African Development Community, SADC, um, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAT, and ECAS, the CAPCO, IAPCO, to adopt comprehensive regional strategies that deal with TOC issues from a holistic perspective. The draft SADC TOC strategy, for example, address measures to protect critical infrastructure, protect borders, promote international cooperation, mobilize resources for uh, preventing and combating TOC and many other issues that underlie uh, cooperation. For example, it calls for the establishment of an arrest warrant and provide for the establishment of many regional tax forces for information sharing and databases. Um, I know I have uh, exhausted my time, but thank you very much. I hope that in the next uh, question, I will be able to uh, make up for the time loss. Thank you very much, uh, Kat. No problem. These are This is an excellent introduction to sort of the endeavor, um, a reminder to us of what the ENACT Index covers and what it's about. And then um, we have some really concrete examples of what you all are doing on the basis of that data. So we should definitely delve into that more. I encourage you to... Um, yeah, talk to us more about that as we move through. Uh, for the moment, let me move to Brooke uh, for a second and ask you, um, Brooke, you know, how do development issues affect transnational organized crime? 
and how should they play into our response to it? I know that um, USAID um, uh, has just released technical guidance on the development response to organized crime, which you worked on and spearheaded. So if you could give us some insight from that perspective, please. Thanks, Kat. I, I also want to echo uh, Mr. Ely's thanks to ACSS and to you for the opportunity to speak here today. It's truly an honor to close out what I found to be a highly engaging and enlightening series uh, alongside Martin. I also want to give a special thanks to Phyllis Deninia with Management Systems International. Phyllis was the lead researcher on a series of projects on development and organized crime, and much of what I will say here today draws from our work together that culminated in the technical guidance uh, that you referenced in your remarks as well. So USAID missions across the globe from Albania to Zambia have identified organized crime as a key factor affecting the environment in which we work. Big picture, organized crime is yet another symptom of the underlying development challenges confronting Africa and, and elsewhere. Martin did an excellent job of highlighting the key development facilitating factors of organized crime related to governance, which criminal networks take advantage of to co-op government officials and political and economic elites, and thereby minimize the risk of detection and prosecution. So I'm not going to take time going over these again. Um, I just echo most of uh, you know what Martin said. Um, the analysis around socioeconomic development and organized crime is, is relatively complex and specific incentives vary at the individual level, often along the lines of the type of organized crime and the individual's role within the criminal network. Although there is a clear need for more rigorous and robust data-driven analytic research in this field, the existing literature does highlight the importance of social ties or contacts and specialized knowledge through occupation or previous criminality, as well as the importance of monetary gain improving social status and negative life events, such as financial setback and family problems. So the economic picture is much more nuanced than the, than the shorthand we often use around poverty. In terms of the development response, I wanna make three main points. First, USAID and other development actors directly counter various forms of organized crime, particularly trafficking in persons, wildlife and other natural resources, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, illicit finance, and um, other programming that aims to increase the risks of engaging in criminal behavior by supporting justice and law enforcement system. Second, the fact is that development efforts in combating organized crime beyond those that specifically support the criminal justice sector are often overlooked as we think about our global response to organized crime. We know, however, the significant value that broader development approaches can play in combating incentives to engage in organized criminal activity, whether those incentives are systematic or individual in nature. Development efforts strengthen the long-term ability of governments, civil society, the media, and communities to address these underlying factors that allow transnational organized crime to flourish by improving the transparency and capacity of public institutions, increasing access to justice, improving the effectiveness and professionalism of the, public, of the public sector, reducing corruption, fraud, and impunity, and supporting legitimate livelihoods. These efforts also decrease the power of criminal efforts, sorry, of criminal networks to influence or co-opt government officials and political and economic elites through bribes, threats, or other means. The prevention approach takes the aim at the incentives for engaging in illicit activities. And by incentives, I mean the factors that prompt someone to engage in criminal activities, such as limited opportunities in illicit markets, expectations for those who are breadwinners or the lure of wealth and status. There are a range of development programs that aim, aim to prevent crime. They may promote illicit livelihoods, education, health services, recreational activities, psychosocial services, civil rights protections, social and gender norm change, and professionalization within the public sector. Other programs aim to shrink the criminal markets. They strive to decrease demand for illicit goods and services through social and behavior change and advocacy for more stringent laws. For some of these efforts, development practitioners have joined a growing number of stakeholders to call for supply chains that are clean 
that is free from unethical or illicit activities such as child labor, human trafficking, armed conflict fi financing, or illegal harvesting or extraction of natural resources. Support for clean supply chains ranges from traceability and certification schemes to customs operations to a whole host of efforts and often engage our private sector counterparts and our government counterparts across the continent and elsewhere. Third, and finally, corruption and impunity, particularly for political and economic elites, warrant particular attention as a critical underlying factor that often goes hand in glove with organized crime. Although weak institutions may reflect capacity deficits, they may also reflect complicit governments that deliberately starve offices of funds, interfere with meritocratic staffing, or limit the power of laws and prosecutorial tools. Addressing state complicity in organized crime requires efforts to strengthen accountability in government through enhanced anti-corruption laws, increased transparency, and strengthen checks and balances, as well as social oversight, awareness raising, changing social norms, advocacy, investigative journalism, and other civil society initiatives. And I'll talk about these more, I'm assuming, in Q&A or in other questions. But the key point here that I really want to emphasize is that preventing crime and addressing underlying factors, particularly corruption, are necessary complements to prosecution. Prosecution is absolutely needed to disrupt criminal networks already in operation, but prevention is needed to reduce the ongoing supply of new participants. We heard this in many different ways in our most recent case study interviews that inform the technical guidance. Put succinctly, one interview noted, interviewee noted, Prosecution is the short game. Prevention is the long game. Thank you, Brooke, um, for um, segueing us into what actually I wanted to touch upon with both of you next, um, which is the issue of state embedded actors, um, high level government actors who may be enabling or facilitating um, transnational organized crime in various forms. So let me turn back to Martin for a few minutes. In about six minutes, could you um, talk to us a bit about this finding from the ENACT Organized Crime Index, which is in fact that the most common way that transnational organized crime happens across Africa is through certain high level government officials using the power of their public office in conjunction with criminal networks to facilitate crime. Um, so uh, given that finding on your index, what rule of law, transparency or accountability actions can state and civil society actors take to try to start addressing this common pattern that Brooke has outlined for us? Indeed, uh, uh, Kat, uh, one of the major findings of the index uh, has been the key role of state embedded actors, or what I call the enemy within. Uh, they play an instrumental role as enablers, either by turning a blind eye to corruption or facilitating the job of TOC suspect by issuing them travel documents, fraudulent licenses, and providing other vital logistics for the commission of a crime. In some cases, state embedded actors are themselves the kingpins of the criminal market, which means that they play a central role in terms of determining uh, the, the scope, the reach, and the volume of the market. We have seen too many reports of ministers and even head of state transporting wildlife products worth millions of dollars. It is not only a high level matter. We have seen police and custom officers and other law enforcement officers, including judges taking bribes or participating or facilitating organized crime. Many guns survive because of their symbiotic relationship with law enforcement agencies. In South Africa, for example, we saw a situation where the whole state was captured. Such a situation cannot take place without the critical role of state actors, particularly individuals who use their positions or offices to facilitate organized crime. We, we, re, we, we read too often reports uh, these days about the important role of state embedded actors in the heroin economy in Mozambique. A number of high profile government officials were associated with rhino horn trafficking 
in the previous regime in Zimbabwe, rhino horn and actually elephant tops also. These are only a few examples, but it is a phenomenon that has affected nearly every country on the continent. The second part of your question asks about the rule of law and accountability actions that state and civil society can take to address uh, uh, the, uh, the patterns that I have just described uh, above. Many states are already taking drastic actions to eliminate the enemy within and to address other uh, sources or favorable conditions that allow these individuals to survive in a system. An increased number of police officers are being prosecuted and some have been uh, actually uh, convicted and given harsh sentences in South Africa, for example, uh, the state created the Zondo Commission to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute those who looted the state and facilitated the state capture. In Nigeria, numerous anti-corruption commissions have been created, some of which demonstrated short-term or short-time effectiveness in investigating and prosecuting uh, looters of the state. We have also seen a number of governments uh, being, uh, a number of government bring back looted funds that were kept in banks abroad. Civil society organizations play an important role as whistleblower. Some including journalists have helped to investigate and detect corrupt state officials. A number of civil society organizations, particularly research institutions like the ISS, have not only helped to improve public knowledge and understanding of these issues, we have also supported the strengthening of state capacity to respond, to respond, including through investigation and prosecution of such cases. These initiatives have helped to identify the sources of impunity and the complex context in which corruption occurs. Some of our current work on the issue have examine the issue of conflict of interest and how, if not well implemented, could be an enabler of TOC. Despite these measures, one area stands out where Africa is yet to make inroad in the fight against criminality. This is the issue of cyber security. Many governments still lack the capacity to implement police functions on the internet, especially with respect to investigation detection, interception, and prosecution of cyber threat cases. Just last week, hackers hacked the port in Durban and brought the shipping line to a standstill. There are many examples like this across Africa where cyber criminals have not only looted businesses, but have also brought state institutions to a halt. Kat, I was very happy to see that uh, the next webinar, the next ACSS webinar will be on cyberspace uh, security priorities for Africa's national security actors. This is extremely important to address a threat, which I think continue to prevail across the continent where countries have very little capacity. To address all of this uh, requires political will manifested through increased allocation of resources, training and retention of skills. We also need to further support civil society organizations in Africa to be more independent and to have the requisite skills and resources as well as protection from the state in order to combat corruption and the role of the state embedded actors in enabling organized crime. I want to stop here and thank you. And of course, um, can dwell uh, uh, further on each of these uh, aspects. Uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Martin, for that overview of um, some of the things, um, some of the different resilience factors and also policy measures that could be um, that we can be leaning upon and that people in um, various African countries already seem to be trying to use um, in efforts to do this. Um, let me turn to Brooke. Um, on, uh, you know, I think this is a, a related issue. I want to come back, Brooke talked a lot about incentives on the individual level and the systemic level and how that plays into um, how transnational organized crime is carried out. Um, and I think this plays into the state embedded actors question a bit as well, but 
Could you explain to us why it's important for African policymakers to understand the different incentives that actors might have for engaging in crime? Could you go into that a bit more? How does accounting for the risk factors and the incentives that people face shed light on criminal market convergence, which is um, a concept that you bring up in um, a, the read ahead that we have for this webinar. So there was a read ahead document that was transmitted along with the invitation to this webinar on criminal market convergence. It's also on the website. So if you missed that, you can still take a look. We have it translated in uh, English, French, and Portuguese uh, for our participants. But um, could you explain a little bit about what that is and why it's useful for understanding some of the incentives behind why transnational organized crime is happening? Thanks, Kat. Yeah, I want to go after Martin and all of my panel because I can just say ditto and then and then stop there. Um, so th thanks for that. Those are great, great remarks. Um, you know, as you've flagged, really understanding the various and, and differing individual and systematic risks and incentives for organized crime is a critical uh, component of adopting an effective and appropriate response. There's no one size fits all in this space. Um, and the political economy lens that ACSS has emphasized throughout this webinar series is a key aspect to effectively understanding and addressing these various risks and incentives. As I mentioned earlier, poverty and unemployment are often highlighted as incentives, particularly for the rank and file of criminal organizations. Yet analysis of backgrounds and incentives for, for example, of African drug mules highlight that many mules are actually employed often in trade, transportation, or travel sectors where their occupations actually assist in the movement of drugs or other commodities. And this is just one illustration. I don't want to downplay uh, the role that poverty and unemployment can play, but I think it's helpful to, to have a slightly nuanced understanding. And this gets at why we really need to be looking at individual risks and, and incentives. Arrested African drug mules often highlight expectations to provide for their family or their broader communities as individuals who have employment or are seen as um, a source of financial support for their families or communities. And so there's, there's pressure that is, that is involved that, that often feeds in more so than, than a strict abject poverty um, dynamic. In addition, many mules reported suffering a financial setback, for example, an unexpected healthcare expense or losing a political campaign that was co costly or a um, damage to a business in a fire. So these are the, some of the key drivers that, that African mules have, have identified in engaging in organized crime. So a more nuanced understanding can shift the response from something like giving microfinance support to generate employment in sectors that are actually susceptible to mule recruitment towards efforts that help mitigate these financial shocks or help shift norms and provide social safety nets. Um, so that's, that's one illustration of why it's important. Second, improving understanding of social norms is key when seeking to address incentives and risks for engaging in organized crime. One of the round table, paper, round table and white papers that, um, that we worked on as part of the USAID's work, recent work stream on organized crime, this, this particular round table and white paper were co-led by Diana Chigas and Cheyenne Charbatsky Church. It focused on the importance of understanding and addressing social norms. This is really important. People may ignore laws or act against their own beliefs if the pressure they experience as a result of social, social norms prevails. And that's often the case. Whereas raising awareness on laws and the impact of crimes may change attitudes and beliefs, in order to really change actions and change social norms, you may need to focus on the beliefs that people have about what others in their social group do, think, and expect of them, and what is considered normal. Social norms can exert a powerful influence on behavior and act as a break on intervention. For example, Laws may ban the ivory trade, but if social norms confer status on ivory products, it could sustain the trade. Social and behavior change strategies may include publici publicizing trendsetters and what we call positive deviants, people who are acting out of the norm, facilitating group deliberation and reflection, creating a new reference group and supporting role models. And I'm gonna focus um, on my last comments on this, on the reference group. It's because I think it's particularly important for the ACSS audience. 
So a reference group connotes the group whose judgment a person cares about in relation to a particular behavior, and which may be able to enact social sanctions against them. Forming a new group can help change the dynamics in relation to social norms. A new reference group can allow mutual support, but also provides a new reference point for members to determine what is typical and approved. The Provide Justice Network, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, brought together approximately 40 judicial actor actors and another 60 civil society allies with a reputation for integrity to work together to resist engaging in corrupt practices. The group provided both support and encouragement, as well as some protection, for each other to withstand any social sanction for refusing corruption, and served as a new reference group whose approval or disapproval counted in their behavioral decisions in difficult situations. ACFS participants and alumni can form a critical reference group to support each other in the difficult challenges that you all may face in carrying out your extremely challenging and critical work. Third and finally, understanding the incentives and influence of various actors, particularly when combined with systems thinking, can also help us move beyond a focus on prosecuting, arresting, identifying the low hanging fruit, these lowest level criminals, to actually providing a better understanding of the systems of organized crime and corruption. And this approach can help identify key stakeholders with particular influence, including complicit political and economic elites, and it also can help identify actors who are involved in multiple criminal markets. This gets to your convergence point, Kat, including key facilitator whose transportation, financial, legal, and logistical businesses often engage in both licit and illicit endeavors and play a really central role in a range of criminal activities, but often go um, unaddressed. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brooke, for those examples of why paying attention to the incentives behind different actors for getting involved matters, and then how um, some of these social norms and livelihood factors play into, um, yeah, why, why, how those incentives are shaped as well. Um, I'm going to stick with you and ask one final question to you, Brooke, and then we'll come back to Martin before we open to the Q&A. And it's related to, I want to ask you a follow-up question related to criminal market convergence. And you had alluded to it a bit at the end here. Um, how might using that convergence lens, this idea that there are organized criminal actors who might take advantage of multiple criminal markets at once to make a profit, um, to do their work, uh, and that they might shift over time across different markets. How is that lens useful for the African security and justice actors we have in the audience in terms of how they might approach countering and preventing transnational organized crime. I wanna give you a few more minutes to talk to us in more depth about um, how that lens could be applied and why it might be useful to our audience. Absolutely. So as you said, you know, many parts of the world, including in many African countries, multiple criminal, criminal markets are operating in the same space. And to varying degrees, criminal markets overlap or can reinforce each other. For example, illicit minerals trade utilizing labor from human trafficking or drugs or their precursor chemicals being exchanged for wildlife commodities or illicit firearms bolstering gang control over drug turf. So systems of transporting commodities and laundering criminal profits are also a common across multiple markets. The convergence lens can improve policy and programmatic responses to organized crime because it can help clarify the reach of corrupt arrangements ac across markets, locales, and parts of the government. And understanding the contours of the illicit political, excuse me, illicit political economy is crucial for inter interrupting the relationships between criminal actors and their protectors and that, that Martin had, had spoken a lot about and strengthening points of weakness in the accountability system. The paper that you've shared with the participants draws heavily from a roundtable that USAID uh, actually co-hosted with the ENACT Consortium in Cape Town. Um, and it identifies three main types of criminal market convergence. Now, there are other reports. The, the UK has issued report talking about criminal market convergence. There's reports on wildlife trafficking. There's a million ways to slice and dice it. The way that we talk about it in the paper is, is in three ways. So first, you can have, as you mentioned, uh, a criminal organi an organized crime group that operates in multiple illicit business lines. So for example, as Martin referenced, there are crime groups in Mozambique that um, have actually concealed rubies in ivory containers. Um, and I, sorry, ruby and 
rubies and ivory in containers of uh, illicit timber. Um, second, you can have a transactional convergence where organized crime group groups purchase goods or services from each other. For example, a drug trafficking organization purchase, purchasing weapons from an armed group or from uh, an arms dealer. And third, organized crimes can purchase similar services from a common provider. That's often banking, accounting, and other financial services, legal counsel, forgery, communications, shipping, storage, front companies courts, border crossing, airports, or corruption networks. And I list these out because they're not typically what we think of when we think of going after organized crime, but they're a key component of these networks uh, and this convergence. Um, so drawing from experiences in, in violence reduction, the convergence blend really helps us concentrate our resources on what's often a relatively small cluster of people, places, and behaviors that are responsible for the majority of crime and violence. And um, Finally, uh, a convergence lens may also help identify key nodes and criminal networks that represent points of vulnerability. So this links to what I was talking about oftentimes in terms of what we can talk about is like the facilitators or the protectors of organized crime. Um, those can be easier I, often to identify if you take a convergence lens because they're often common among different forms of criminality and criminal networks. I know when we did research in Kenya, for example, there was a a lawyer who I will not name and shame, um, but who is known as the lawyer for organized criminal networks. And you could see his caseload across different, um, across different areas where he was providing services. So targeting these nodes and criminal networks may disrupt multiple criminal activities simultaneously, making networks less efficient, disrupting trusted relationships, raising the cost of doing business and moving beyond prosecution of the small fish that are easily replaced. And finally, I just I do want to make a small point that although the convergent lens presents many opportunities, it's not without potential draw, drawbacks as well. As highlighted in the white paper, looking at the more holistic picture rather than focusing on a specific form of organized crime could incur greater political risk. You have a higher probability in the same way that you have a higher probability that one of the areas that you're looking at might have some political will to address it. There's also a higher probability that one of the areas might have some strong incentives um, not to address it. It also could shift the focus away from the most pressing issues of, of various forms of organized crime where there, where there is divergence. So for example, in South Africa, if you look at human trafficking and minerals, you could end up, uh, or drugs, uh, drug trafficking, you could end up focusing on sexual exploitation while actually labor trafficking is a much more pressing or pre prevalent issue uh, around human trafficking in, in South Africa, um, uh, you know, in many respects. Um, and then finally, it could strain the capacity of judicial systems as it increases the complexity of prosecuting and educating crime. In addition, with the focus on geographic convergence, like all things that we do when we address something like transnational organized crime, it may actually shift the problem to another geography. And that's something we need to be thoughtful of in all of our, our work in this space is the balloon effect. So I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you. No, that's a wonderful rundown as well of um, how it could, uh, con using a convergence lens can um, bring a lot of benefit, but also maybe add some complexity that's something to be taken into account as well um, in terms of what's actually going on case by case. Um, so building on that, let me turn back to Martin uh, and ask you one more question, Martin, trying to relate some of what Brooke has said here about convergence and incentives back to the ENACT index as well. So could you speak to us for a few minutes about what the different criminality and resilience quadrants are on the index? You've organized each African country scored on the index into um, four different categories related to whether they're high or low criminality and high or low resilience. So why is it useful for our listeners to check out the index, understand where their country falls in terms of those quadrants, and maybe also understand where their neighbors fall on those quadrants? Could you break that down for us in about five or six minutes, if possible? Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the greatest uh, contributions of the index uh, has been the analysis on the relationship between criminality and resilience. Um, previously, our only understanding of the correlation between the two uh, was that high criminality leads to low resilience and vice versa. The index has, however, produced a criminality resilient quadrant, which you have referred to, which shows uh, four different possible relationships between uh, the two. 
Uh, and I think from uh, 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 Brooke's uh, discussion in terms of the convergence, um, the index uh, it, it elaborates a lot on that uh, uh, convergence among criminal actors. And particularly in this case to show uh, where countries need to focus their resources uh, rather than uh, as it was the case uh, before, uh, countries will just be spending, uh, say for example, they are fighting uh, human trafficking of which uh, human trafficking is not the biggest issue. The issue is actually arms trafficking. So through the, the, the index, through the analysis uh, and the scoring of the index, countries can actually sharpen uh, their focus uh, and target uh, uh, sectors that are of priority um, for combating transnational organized crime. Uh, but uh, in terms of the, the four scenarios uh, of the quadrant, uh, where countries fall into, all the countries have been grouped actually into these uh, four uh, uh, scenarios. The first one um, is high criminality and high resilience. Uh, this scenario contradicts conventional wisdom, which state that uh, when criminality is high, resilience is supposed to be low. Here in this case, we are seeing a situation where um, criminality is high, and resilience is also high. Uh, the second scenario is where you have um, low criminality and low uh, um, low criminality and low resilience. Now, this is an ideal situation. This is where you want to be. Uh, you want to have uh, low criminality and high resilience because the resilience can always stabilize uh, things. Uh, then you have a scenario of uh, low criminality and low resilience. Oh, sorry, the first one was low criminality and high resilience, uh, which is uh, the ID situation for every uh, country. Uh, but the, the third scenario, which is the low criminality and low resilience, um, is also a situation which is very complex. It means that it's very difficult for countries to get out of such a situation. Uh, because they lack the capacity to actually address um, the criminality, uh, which is uh, low, but could be growing over time. Um, so what countries need to have is um, high resilience. Once your resilience is high, um, it is difficult for uh, criminal, uh, criminals to actually break through certain sectors. Then you have uh, the fourth uh, scenario, which is high criminality and low resilience. Um, this is uh, also a situation which I think um, is the conventional wisdom, uh, stating it uh, bluntly, that uh, when you have high criminality, you have low resilience. Now, let's, uh, let's quickly just look at um, um, how African countries fit uh, into these uh, um, uh, four scenarios. Now, the blue eyed boys, uh, I mean, the, the um, low criminality and high resilience. Um, in Africa, countries that fall into this are Mauritius, you have um, Morocco, you have Ghana, you have Ethiopia, Cap Verde, Botswana, uh, Namibia, Rwanda, Senegal, Seychelles, uh, and Tunisia. Uh, these are the countries that I think have the ID situation um, where the, uh, the criminality is very low, uh, but they have high resilience, which means that they can actually uh, face uh, the situation effectively. Then we, we have um, the scenario of um, uh, high criminality and low resilience, um, which is in my view where many African uh, countries uh, fall into. Um, quite a number of them, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, Democratic Republic of Congo, Guinea, uh, Libya, Madagascar, and so on and so forth. Most of those countries where you have conflict, where uh, you also have um, endemic uh, criminality. Then you, you have a situation the, uh, or the scenario of high criminality and high resilience, which is uh, very contradictory, uh, but we have uh, uh, countries in Africa that fall into that category. Uh, there are essentially three of them, uh, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, and South Africa. These are countries that uh, when you, they, they do have the mechanisms in place, they do have, and they are actually taking a wide range of actions to address uh, criminality. Uh, but the, 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 the point is criminality remains very, very high. If you go to Nigeria today, um, 
I think we all know the situation there in terms of uh, the criminality, the, the, the many uh, uh, criminal actors that we have, um, you know, in South Africa, it is also the same. A lot of gangs that are making it very difficult for a lot of people, same situation uh, in Kenya. Well, it is not the idea, but um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place to be, uh, which is not very problematic, but you, you have countries that are making a substantial effort to eliminate the threat of uh, transnational organized crime. And then uh, the, the scenario of low criminality and low resilience, um, we have um, countries also in Africa that fall into that uh, category. Um, we have uh, countries like Angola, Benin, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Comoros, Djibouti, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Eswatini, Gabon, Gambia. These are countries where when you go there, you don't immediately feel, you don't feel actually criminality at all, but you don't also feel the state. You don't also feel uh, as if the state is present, the state doing so many of these things to alleviate uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, of the people. So this is, uh, for some people, they prefer to, to be here um, where things are okay, uh, but we know that the criminality can actually get high because resilience is not there. So weak resilience uh, cannot really stop criminality. So you don't want to have uh, weak resilience in this case, one high resilience. And then we try to test um, the um, to test the, the index to see whether um, this quadrant can actually respond to some of the analysis that are out there. And for example, when we look at it from the governance perspective that I talked about earlier, um, we try to look at whether those countries uh, with uh, high resilience, um, you know, um, high resilience and low criminality, where do they for actually um, in indices that are out there. For example, if you take the Mo Ibrahim uh, um, uh, index on uh, governance in Africa. Um, now we, we try to locate these countries. We see that uh, countries that are actually performing very well in the Mo Ibrahim uh, index are also countries uh, that fall uh, largely within the scenario of uh, low criminality and high resilience meaning that the high resilience, um, they have the necessary gov governance uh, 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 machines, uh, governance uh, um, uh, instrument or mechanisms to actually uh, deal with a lot of the uh, uh, criminal threats uh, that they face. Um, take, for example, uh, Cap Verde, uh, Seychelles, Botswana, Tunisia, Mauritius. Um, these are countries that uh, are high performing in the uh, Mo Ibrahim uh, uh, index, uh, just to talk of a few of them. And, and also, if you look at the, the uh, index for uh, uh, human, the human security index, you see that countries that are performing very high in the human security index are also countries that fall largely within the low criminality and high resilience uh, uh, scenario in the, in the organized crime index. Um, of enact so uh, which means that the the index uh, in, indeed uh, reflects uh, reality and is in conformity with many of the indices that uh, you will find out there on uh, analysis on organized crime governance and human security thank you very much i'd like to end here so that uh, we can have uh, more time um, for discussion no, thank you very much, Martin. I think this is an important point to end on. It ties together um, some of um, the guidance um, that Brooke has talked to us about and ties us back to the index, which I know um, in our first webinar in this series, Martin was with us to introduce um, the index. Um, and so uh, the, the, I think in summary, um, I encourage all of our participants to visit the materials on our um, webinar website because there's an ENACT report um, that has a very useful map where you can look up what status your country is. Is your country low criminality, low resilience, low criminality, high resilience, or high criminality, high resilience, high criminality, low resilience. So there are those four categories. You can kind of see what your neighborhood looks like, what your country is rated as, and then there are country specific reports that you can click on to understand what makes the resilience in a particular place, a particular level, um, according to their index. And so that could be a really useful place to start 
we're thinking further critically about what kinds of um, additional responses to transnational organized crime might be useful. And just to summarize some of what um, Martin nicely illustrated for us, we had some questions in the chat, Martin, while you were speaking um, to provide some examples of countries from each of these categories. So I tried to do that, typing out a couple, just looking at the map from the ENACT report in the chat. Um, but I think, um, yeah, looking at the visuals in their report could be very useful. And also, as Martin said, there are some different implications depending on which different levels you see in your own country. Um, but it sounds like one of the big messages is that regardless of where your country sits in one of these quadrants, working on building up resilience through some of these different factors that the index is measuring could be a good preventative tool because having more ability to um, be resilient allows you to then, in effect, um, try to change the criminality dynamics that may, may exist in your country or in your region. Um, so I think even countries with high resilience and low criminality have preventative things that they could do in the resilience area in order to um, uh, deal with what's going on in the region and to prevent themselves from changing into a country maybe with um, less resilience or higher criminality. Um, so hopefully I got that right sort of in the summary, Martin. I know it's more complicated than that, depending no, on- you that. did, you did really well. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so we have about 15 minutes left and I'd like to make sure we have time to do some Q&A with uh, the alumni and the audience. So once again, I encourage you, we, we um, please type your questions in the chat. Um, I haven't seen very many, I've seen a couple, but not very many. So if you have a question, you can type it in, in French, Portuguese, or English, and our team will process them and I can ask them to our uh, panelists. Um, but for now, I think I, we've collected a couple. So I'm going to um, throw them all at you at once, Martin and Brooke, and then you'll each have a chance to respond to whichever ones make most sense to you. Um, so we did get um, one comment, which I think I'm going to turn into a question because I think it's, it could be a useful one um, in terms of specific examples of measures that could be taken uh, to prevent or counter crime. Um, we had somebody in the audience commenting about national coordination centers that could be formed or even early warning systems of various sorts that might be useful as preventative measures um, that sort of could also help us track um, criminal market convergence when and where it's happening uh, that could help us deal um, on the regional level with these uh, countries that fall into these different quadrants where they have different criminality and resilience profiles that we're needing to deal with collectively. So could you comment on um, the utility of these ideas, the National Coordination Center or the early warning system? Are there things that you've already seen people doing that are useful? Are there things that could still be done through these mechanisms that would be useful as a response? Um, and we had another question about um, the nexus between the potential nexus between terrorism and transnational organized crime. And I, I, I can see this maybe coming into play in Brooke's work on convergence. Um, to what extent um, might we um, consider terrorism within this framework as well? And what are some of the caveats or the advantages of, of, of doing that? Because we do see different kinds of linkages between organized criminal networks and violent extremists. They aren't always one and the same, but they could have some of these operational connections maybe that Brooke is described finding in her own work. Um, and then let me look, I think there may be a third that I can add to the mix here. Um, we have another comment from an attendee saying, um, you know, asking about what about local level actors and local level initiatives? Um, he says, he or she says, the solution seems to me um, to, um, uh, raise awareness among local associations and organized groups in the population, in the general population, um, so that there's a better understanding of organized crime and make it a local issue. Um, so to what extent, this reminds me sort of of some of what Brooke was saying maybe about social norms. Um, Martin, I'm wondering in your ROCO work, what sort of local initiatives and innovations you're observing? So there are those three questions local innovations, potential nexus with terrorism, and what about early warning or national coordination centers as um, sort of some of the places we could start? Could I, I and we have about 10 minutes, um, could I start with Martin and then we'll go to Brooke? <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Kat. And um, I also want to thank uh, the participant, those that have uh, uh, asked these very excellent uh, questions. 
Um, let me start with the national coordination centers and early warning centers. Uh, it looks like this person is reading from uh, some of the um, uh, um, regional mechanisms that we have done, the SADC um, uh, organized crime strategy uh, deals a lot with this and it brings together the national coordination centers. In my earlier, um, in the first question that I answer I actually mentioned about the creation of um, regional tax forces for information sharing and uh, uh, coordination. So I think this falls uh, um, exactly into that uh, framework and these are extremely important. Now, the, the point I want to make about early warning um, in Africa, which we have seen, and it has come up in so many, um, so many sessions, each time there is a debate, early warning shows up. I think that uh, the challenge in Africa is not about early warning. It's not that we don't see when these things are coming. Um, the problem in Africa is that early response is not yet developed. So I think the emphasis for me should rather be on early response rather than on early warning. And the thing, the emphasis on early response uh, means that you automatically talk about early warning. But if you just talk about early warning, most people will not talk about early response. So I think that we should rather be talking about early response um, and in that sense, uh, bring in early warning to uh, inform that early response. Then the, the question about nexus uh, between terrorism and transnational organized crime, I think this is a serious matter. It's one of the areas of convergence that uh, uh, Brooke talked a lot. Um, and um, it's a situation that is happening. We see this in Mozambique. Uh, I think Brooke also referred to uh, the situation where the, the insurgents or the uh, Islamists, or you want to call them terrorists in Mozambique, uh, are actually collaborating with um, uh, organized crime criminals, uh, you know, through different framework, whether it is a business or it's for security or it's just, uh, you know, for all sort of uh, different trade. So that's, that's already there. But the, the point, I think the emphasis for us should be, how do we deal with uh, the nexus? You know, what measures do we need to take to deal with the nexus? I think the inf the, what comes out of this is that you can no longer say you are just fighting terrorism alone. You can no longer say you are just fighting organized crime alone. Um, today, because of the debate uh, the, 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 of the nexus, we need to fight both at the same time. The only way for you to effectively counter terrorism is by fighting organized crime. And the only way for you to effectively counter organized crime is by fighting terrorism. So um, this nexus discussion is extremely important. It reflects uh, the, the shift in the criminality uh, landscape in Africa and the need for us to also shift uh, reaction. Uh, the sensitization of groups, excellent. This, this is an excellent point. This is uh, what we should be doing. Um, sometimes uh, ignorance is what promotes uh, crime, uh, but by sensitizing those that really matter and bringing the fight to the community level, I think this is uh, absolutely important because the community knows the, the problem better than uh, those at the, uh, uh, the capital or those from the urban areas. So let's take it to the community. I will add that we need to emphasize the role of youth. Uh, which in my uh, uh, in answering the first question, I, I emphasize the, the fact that youth should actually be at the center of the fight against uh, organized crime, because many of them are those who participate in it. If they are well sensitized, I'm sure that we'll be able to uh, persuade quite a number of them uh, not to be part of that uh, 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 criminality. Um, I think I will stop here because I think the questions for me, uh, many of them were really like uh, additions or commentary uh, to what we have already emphasized. Thank you very much. I'll turn to Brooke and Brooke, just for fun, since there are only five minutes and you have three questions, I'll add one more into the mix that came in while Martin was talking, but I think um, speaks to your issue area expertise asking, um, is there not this uncanny uh, linkage uh, between um, a rise in transnational organized crime and the um, illicit exploitation of natural resources in Africa by multinational companies? So if you have any thoughts about that, feel free to share those as well. Thanks, Kat. Um, I appreciate the gauntlet and, uh, and Martin's ability to do such a good job of responding um, to, the, to the previous raised questions. Um, I, I wanna hit on the question around the convergence with terrorism. 
And um, and I have basically two two comments on that front. Um, absolutely, it's a critical area to explore. And I have been thrilled over the years of watching the discourse around this shift from a very simplified concept of organized criminal activities fund terrorist organizations and and a, and a almost myopic perspective on organized crime that just focuses on terrorist financing to a much more nuanced and um, complex understanding of these key dynamics. And you can see in places like Mali, where um, you know, criminal, organized criminal networks who far predated violent extremist activities in Northern Mali actually became part of the problem when they were utilized to, fund, to, to as a counterbalance to combat the violent extremist actors uh, in, in Northern Mali. And so I think we, you know, we as a community have really learned a lot. Um, and, and I would challenge us, and I think one of the lessons that we're learning is, is to not be thinking specifically around the terrorism organized crime nexus, but actually around group-based violence and terrorism nexus. It could be a violent extremist or an ideologically driven organization. It also could be a rogue element of a military that is equally problematic in this nexus space. And so, you know, I've been pleased to watch the field move. The, the terrorism next organized crime link is critical and it's only part of the picture and often oversimplified. So this new expanded, expansion and nuance I think is really exciting to see the field um, move forward. And, and the military obviously plays a key role in this and is, and is, a, is a key interlocutor um, that, that, that is you know, critical um, in US government interagency coordination and, and global response as well. Um, so I think I'll leave that. Um, in terms of the local level actors, I, I completely agreed. And I think Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime is, is doing some really interesting work around community level resilience um, that I think highlights the value. As, at the same time, they're also doing really interesting work at the national, regional, global level. And to me, part of the key is it's not one or the other, it's how do we link these up? Because transnational organized crime is inherently transnational and all things are inherently local, right? The problem is inherently local. So linking these two pieces up, I think is really the, the key to the response. And so it's very critical that you've highlighted this local level component of it as well. And then finally on the natural resource um, exploitation, I, I, I could not agree more of the importance of looking at the role of national um, natural resource exploitation and the whole host of actors that are involved in this, whether it's uh, foreign governments, whether it's um, you know the the country of origin of the minerals government, whether it's multinational corporations, um, whether it's the international global financial institutions. This is a very complex web, and I'm just going to circle back to what you've really started the seminar series with, which that's why this political economy angle that you've we've been discussing throughout all of these you know, fascinating conversations is so key because that's what allows you to pull in all of these different actors and not just look at the quote unquote bad guys and the quote unquote good guys, but really look at this complex system and the various incentives that all of the actors within it play. And the last thing that I will just say is a plug for the Organized Crime Index, which I think Kat and Martin have done a great job of, of highlighting. But I'll say I just yesterday in my regular day job just got tasked with something that was looking at describing the transnational organized crime threats in comparing various African countries and the ENACT organized crime index was an invaluable resource to be able to quickly go through. You can even compare countries right on their data web portal. Um, and it was just an invaluable um, reference tool to be able to to um, flag and I can't wait for the next iteration to come out as well and to see how things might have shifted over time. So thanks. Yes, I will say Martin, the next iteration is coming out soon, right? Next month? Yes, it will be launched again in September, um, but um, uh, we are already gathering the data and doing the comparison and the final touches, uh, you know, so. It's going to be very interesting, very, very interesting, the second iteration, because it has given us the opportunity to look at it uh, from a comprehensive perspective, look at the experience that we gain um, in compiling it uh, the first year. So um, this year, really, it's uh, very, very interesting. But the same amount of consultations, if not even more, 
uh, with more experts so that we can test um, the findings and make sure that they are triangulated with various uh, groups from different backgrounds and so on. So uh, please look out uh, for the uh, launch of the uh, second iteration of the index in September at the General Assembly. Great. Well, congratulations on that. And uh, to you know, finish this off, um, I want to thank you both, um, Dr. Brooks Stearns Lawson, Mr. Martin Ailey, for joining us today and for sharing about some of the data and tools that are out there for us to take a look at as we're continuing to refine our responses to transnational organized crime. I want to also thank everyone in our alumni community who is with us today uh, for the webinar. Uh, this is um, technically the end of the first iteration of a series. Um, so we do have an evaluation of the webinar series that we would like, we welcome all of you to take. This feedback helps us a lot when we're designing new programming um, aimed at um, supporting you and your missions and, and our vision uh, for African security at the Africa Center. So please let us know what you thought um, of this webinar, of the webinar series. I believe there will be a link that you will receive over email after the series is complete. Um, so I really encourage you to take that take that survey and tell us what you thought was most helpful and, and least helpful. So thank you to everyone who came. Thank you for those of you who have been with us throughout the series and to the newcomers, and we'll be in touch soon um, with um, the next steps on, on Africa Center programming um, on this, and we hope to stay in touch with you. Many thanks. <laughs>